and welcome to lesson five here in our compounds unit. Our last couple of lessons have really dealt at looking at covalent structures in depth. We're now going to move to a slightly different area of this unit. We're going to look at the rules that we use when we write chemical formulas and when we determine the names of particular substances. This is pretty classic chemistry, but it's also a little dry. The trick here is to practice. The more you practice with this, the better you'll be. And we want to get to a point where this is just second nature. Our first lesson here, lesson five, is going to deal with naming and writing binary ionic compounds. It's really important to understand that the naming and formulating of compounds follows specific rules. You absolutely need to know how to write compound formulas and names according to these rules. These rules are stipulated by IUPAC, which is the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, which I'm sure is as dynamic an organization as it sounds on its face. Are you ready? Let's go. Binary ionic compounds are ionic compounds made out of two elements and only two elements. When we're determining the formula of a binary ionic compound, that formula is always going to be the simplest whole number ratio it can be. We know, of course, that the structure of an ionic compound is a network structure. It just goes on forever. But what we're interested in here is just the simplest ratio, the empirical ratio, or what we might also call the formula unit when we're dealing with ionic compounds. The sum of the ionic charges in our atoms has to equal zero in the formula. The cation, or the metal, always has to be written first, followed by the anion, or the nonmetal. And we're going to use subscripts, small numbers below and to the right of each atom, to indicate how many of each atom is in the compound's formula. Finally, we're never going to use the subscript 1. We just assume it. We wouldn't be writing the element symbol if there wasn't at least one of them in it. This is cesium chloride. Its compound formula is CSCL. Even though it goes on forever, there's one cesium and one chloride ion together in this compound. Let's go and look at some examples of formulating binary ionic compounds. These are not in your packet. I'd like you to determine the formula of the following compounds. Magnesium chloride, tin 2 nitride, and gold 3 chloride. Pause the video and try it on your own before we work through it together to see if you can do it, and then maybe we can just move on. The first thing I'm always going to do when I try to figure out a formula is I'm going to figure out what the ions are that I'm using. In magnesium chloride, magnesium is a 2 plus ion and chloride is a minus ion. In tin 2 nitride, tin 2 is a 2 plus ion and nitrogen is a 3 minus ion. And finally in gold 3 chloride, gold 3 is a 3 plus ion and chloride is a minus ion. Now that I know those, I can put them all together and figure out what the formulas are going to be. Remember that it has to add up to zero. So the formula for magnesium chloride is going to use one magnesium and two chloride ions, MgCl2. The formula for tin 2 nitride is going to use three tins and two nitrogens to get to plus six from the tin and minus six from the nitrogen. And finally, the formula for gold 3 chloride is going to be AuCl3. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have, and then when you're ready, we can move on. Let's talk about how to determine the names of binary ionic compounds. It's not that hard. The cation, the metal, is just given its normal name. Whatever it is off the periodic table, that's the name we're going to write down. But if the cation has more than one possible charge, which would be listed on the periodic table as an oxidation state, the charge it has in this particular compound has to be stated in parentheses after its name as a Roman numeral. This is called the stock system. We already talked about this back when we talked about ions in lessons five and six, but it's a good idea just to remind ourselves of these rules again here in our ionic compound naming. The anion or the nonmetal is just going to have the end of its name changed to IDE. It's important to understand that the anion is always going to have the first negative charge, the one at the top that's listed on the periodic table. So for our substance here made out of cesium and chlorine, its correct name is cesium chloride. I don't have to use the stock system because cesium is a group one metal. It will only have a one plus charge. Let's do some examples together. Determine the names of the following compounds and I've given you three formulas. Again, pause the video and try it on your own. And then when you're ready, let's go through it together. So I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'm going to figure out the charges of the ions in these compounds. The ions in Ki would be K plus and I minus. The ions in Fe2O3 would be Fe3 plus and O2 minus. 
and the ions in CrO3 would be Cr6 plus and O2 minus. Does it make sense how I figured this out? Remember that the sum of the charges in the compound has to add to zero. So for instance, in Fe2O3, I know that oxygen is a two minus ion. And since there are three of them, I know that that's a total of minus six. That tells me that iron has to be plus six. And since there are two of them, I know that that has to be three plus. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, take a moment and note that before we move on. Now that I know what the ions are, I can figure out their names pretty easily. The name of the compound made out of K plus and I minus is going to be potassium iodide. I don't have to use the stock system because potassium only has one possible oxidation state. Fe3O2 is going to be iron three oxide. If we go and look at iron on the periodic table, we see that it has two possible oxidation states. So I have to specify that it's the plus three version in iron three oxide. Similarly, chromium has more than one possible positive oxidation state. So in this case, it's chromium six oxide since chromium is six plus. Do these make sense? If they don't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we move on. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of naming and writing binary ionic compounds and formula. Make sure you can do the following things here. Make sure that you can name and formulate binary ionic compounds in accordance with the IUPAC rules that we've discussed. Also make sure that you can figure out when to use the stock system and use it appropriately. Finally, make sure that you can determine valid and invalid names and formulae for binary ionic compounds. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always leave them in the comments below the video or get in touch with me through the information in the info field. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.